Hello and welcome to another Brawl gameplay video. Today we're taking a look at Kellen the Kid as our commander due to popular request, a 3 mana 3-3 three, three flyer with a lifelink saying whenever we cast a spell from anywhere other than our hand, we may cast a permanent spell with equal or lesser mana value from our hand without paying its mana cost. If we don't, either because we don't want to or we don't have any cards that meet that requirement, we can still put a land card from our hand onto the battlefield. So Kellen's a very interesting build around, since there's a lot of ways you can enable the ability, whether it's with cards with a new plot mechanic, such as a Railway Brawler, can plot it for 4 mana to put it in exile and then cast it for free on the following turn, which will then let us put a 5 mana permanent or cheaper from our hand onto the battlefield with Kellen's ability, but we could also play adventure creatures, since we can first use the adventure side, chop down in the case of giant killer, and then we can cast a 1 mana 1-2 one out of exile, and still maybe use Kellen to put an extra land into play, so those are also fair game. Then you also have the foretell mechanic, Alrond's Epiphany, a great example, can exile it for 2 mana and then later cast it for 7 to take an extra turn, make a pair of bird tokens, and then potentially put a 7 mana permanent into play from our hand for free. And then you also have other mechanics going back, such as Flashback on Storm the Festival, another way to cast a spell from our graveyard and trigger Kellen. There's also the Discover mechanic with the Inner Sun, so that's another way to get the ability going. And then you can also maybe just play creatures off the top of the deck, and there's a whole section here dedicated to those, Augur of Autumn, Elven Chorus. So those are all ways to enable Kellen's ability by just playing creatures off the top, which also counts as somewhere other than our hand. So these are all great ways to enable Kellen's ability, which in turn basically gives us more mana to work with by helping play those spells for free, which means we can dedicate more time drawing cards and accumulating resources since Kellen will help put them on the battlefield. So we end up with this band value pile, which tries to draw a ton of cards, put a lot of lands in play. We also have some landfall synergies, which naturally play well with Kellen as well. So I've uh, split up the deck into a few different categories, starting with the mana acceleration, which includes includes lots of 1 mana elves as well to maybe even play Kellen on turn 2 already, and then some more ways to put a lands on the battlefield. Then we've got our adventure cards, which also include more ways to ramp, so there's a bit of overlap there. Then I've combined the plot and foretell cards into one category. We've got the miscellaneous section, which is mostly just interaction that didn't quite fit into our other themes, and some powerful individual cards like Time Warp to take an extra turn, which is pretty good with our Planeswalkers and other value engines that can accumulate value over time. And then I also want to highlight Fractured Identity as a new card from Outlaws of Thunder Junction, which is probably going to go in a lot of blue-white decks going forward, as it can exile target a non-land permanent, and then create a token that's a copy of that permanent under our control. So it's kind of like stealing it without the risk of the opponent bouncing it back, so that's also quite powerful. And then we've got our cards that allow us to play stuff off the top of our deck, whether it's all spells or just creatures. And then our final category is just another section dedicated to card draw engines that can provide a lot of value over time. There's Planeswalkers in here too, so we kind of diversify Planeswalkers and creatures, so a board wipe isn't necessarily game over. And then more mechanics such as Flashback and Discover that we mentioned that also play well with Kellen. So time for the deep dive, starting with our mana acceleration. At one mana we've got the Avacyn's Pilgrim, Delighted Halfling. These are both very good at helping cast Kellen on turn 2, whereas Elvish Mystic and Lenore Elves require us to start with a multicolor land that makes both green and blue or green and white, otherwise we don't have all three colors on turn 2. Then Explore and Grow Spiral can play an extra land and draw card. And then Paradise Druid and Catilda as mana creatures, Catilda with a powerful activated ability as well. And then I'm only playing Arcane Signet as a 2 mana ramp artifact, since it's clearly the best one. And then Cultivate, a nice 2 for 1 helping us ramp. Tireless Provisioner as one of the landfall payoffs, since we are often playing a bunch of fetch lands and putting additional lands in play with Kellen, so any landfall payoff is useful. This one making food tokens, but more importantly treasure tokens, which can also help us ramp. Then Uro can also put an extra land in play, can eventually escape it out of the graveyard. Then battles are also quite synergistic with Kellen. If we transform Invasion of Zendikar after getting two basics, then we get Awakened Skyclave, and as we cast Awakened Skyclave, it's also outside of our hand, so then we get to put a 4 mana permanent in play potentially. Then there's Oracle of Moldaya to play lands off the top, also very synergistic with all the fetch lands that have been added to Brawl over time, since those can maybe shuffle our deck to find more lands. And then Mirari's Wake is always fun, doubling the mana produced by our lands and giving our team plus one plus one. 
Then our adventures include Giant Killer, can be used as removal. The Daring Traveler can provide some card advantage when it attacks. We've got the Woodland Acolyte, draws when it enters a battlefield, and it's not too difficult to set up the adventure first, so we can use the one mana Ment the Wild to put something back on top, then cast Acolyte out of exile, triggering Kellen, allowing us to put another 3-drop on the battlefield. Then there's Brazen Borrower as a bounce spell. Lovestruck Beast, just a beefy 5-5, five five, also good at enabling the Great Henge, which we'll get to in a second. Then the Rose Thorn Acolyte can easily enable Kellen as well, since the adventure essentially pays for itself, and then we end up with a mana creature. Kellen Inquisitive Prodigy can also help ramp with the two mana adventure, similar to Grow Spiral, and then uh, we also get a nice creature afterwards. Virtue of Loyalty can also be quite powerful if we cast the five mana enchantments. Then there's the Stormkeld Vanguard, giving us an answer to artifacts or enchantments. And then finally Beanstalk Giant, another three mana ramp card, getting an untapped land, and then a powerful creature afterwards. Then our plot and foretell section includes Dust Animus, one of the better cards, can often be a 4-5 flying lifelink. We get Fibblethip to start plotting cards of the top, so I could have also put this in the play stuff of the top category, but uh, I've put it in the plot section instead. We've got Saw It Coming as a counterspell that can be foretold. Kellen joins up. Not the most powerful here since we're pretty limited in how many legendary creatures we have, but uh, still a nice way to plot a card and maybe get some plus one counters out of it. Behold the Multiverse, one of the better foretell card draw spells. We've got the Railway Brawler, as we mentioned, can double our power and toughness going forward. Make Your Own Luck can also be quite powerful if we plot an expensive card with it. And then Elrond's Epiphany, everyone's favorite time walk. And then the miscellaneous interaction includes some of the best cards in the format, such as Source to Plowshares. You could also play with Path to Exile now, but since the opponent gets a replacement land, it's not quite as effective, especially when you target their commander, they can pretty easily replay it on the following turn. Then there's a Wash Away, has a one-mana counter for opposing commanders. Then a Loran can blow up artifacts and enchantments, and can also draw cards afterwards. Even though the opponent also gets to draw, it can still be worth it if it maybe unlocks some of our other card draw engines, such as an Augur of Autumn, which wants to play lands and creatures of the top. Well, now if there's a non-land, non-creature on top, we can still maybe draw it with Loran, and then Augur can provide more value afterwards. Then there's a Force of Vigor, another new addition, which can be cast for free and can maybe take out multiple artifacts from the opponent just by pitching a green spell from our hand, which is pretty easy to accomplish. We've got Time Warp to take an extra turn, and then a Fractured Identity, which I already pointed out. And then our play stuff of the top section includes a reality chip. First need to reconfigure it. Then there's Augur of Autumn, can first play lands and with Coven enabled play creatures as well. Elven Chorus turns all our creatures into mana creatures, and then we can also play them off the top of the deck, similar to Vizier of the Menagerie's ability. And Vivian can also do the same, which can also set up the minus two to maybe tutor up an additional creature out of our deck. Otherwise, we can make beast tokens with various abilities. And then one with a multiverse can help cast a spell for free each turn, as well as play lands and spells off the top. And then our value engines include Tireless Tracker, great with all our fetch lands and Kellum putting additional lands in play. We've got a Vega, which can trigger in a multitude of ways, drawing extra cards. We've got Guardian Project, drawing a card when a creature enters. We've got Ajani, pumping up our team with plus one counters, can also give our Planeswalkers additional loyalty. And it plays pretty well with a 3-3 flying lifelink creature, giving it vigilance and extra counters, makes it difficult for aggressive decks to outrace. Then we've got a Rashmi, which can also trigger once each turn, giving us an extra card while maybe triggering Kellen's ability. Tamiyo is another nice payoff for the banned colors, letting us draw a lot of cards, can tap stuff down, or maybe work our way up towards an ultimate. Then a Jace can also draw us extra cards or bounce opposing creatures back. And as you may have noticed, we don't have a ton of creature interaction in the deck, so sometimes it's nice to have a Planeswalker that can do multiple things. We've got the Silverback Elder, which can trigger and give us extra life, extra lands, or destroy artifacts or enchantments whenever we cast a creature spell. We've got Tatiova drawing us an extra card and gaining a life with a landfall. We've got Chulain drawing extra cards when creatures enter. Can also pick them back up to maybe re-enable an adventure. And then a Storm the Festival, the only flashback card in the deck. We've got quite a few powerful five mana permanents we could hit with it and then still flash it back. Then there's Ajani finding additional permanents with a plus two. And then it's got uh, Swords to Plowshares built into the minus two essentially. And then we've got uh, the Inner Sun to discover each turn, make our spells uncounterable. And the Great Henge, especially nice with some of our bigger creatures, like the Lovestruck Beast, can cheaply play it and then also draw extra cards, gain life and make extra mana. 
And then the mana base needs a couple basics since we need to search those up occasionally. The channel lands offer more utility and then as many untapped dual lands as possible. So that includes pain lands. We've got the Innistrad duels coming into play untapped later. The check lands are pretty easy to enable with the combination of shock lands like Hallowed Fountain, which counts as a plains and an island, as well as the new surveil lands. These do enter tapped, but we do get to surveil when they enter, and they also count as both land types. And then the pathways are also pretty nice to have, since they're always untapped. And then the Headquarters as a tri land, command tower, also a must have, and then all the fetch lands, which as we said can get shock lands and surveil lands now. So sometimes we just fetch those up end of turn to get the extra surveil, and then it doesn't really matter that they came into play tapped. And then Prismatic Vista, a new special guest also introduced in Outlaws of Thunder Junction, so don't forget to craft that one as well. So yeah, that's our deck. Now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Okay, we're on the draw, facing Tom Bombadil Sagas, and uh, yeah, our hands could be all right. Giant Killer technically an answer to Tom, as long as it doesn't have Hexproof and Indestructible, which is often the case. Turn 1 Pilgrim can actually set up turn 2 Kellen. Sure, I'll try it. Augur of Autumn's not bad either, so I want to get... A green white land here. And then Soaring City sets up Kellen on two. And Fractured Identity potentially an answer to an opposing saga. Conundrum kind of stops us from ramping by putting additional lands in play which can certainly matter with Kellen's ability. For now, can play Augur of Autumn. Get that going, or if we're afraid of a sweeper, just foretell Alrun's Epiphany, but yeah, I think it's fine to play the Augur. Land coming up. And then I don't think I'm interested in playing a one mana giant killer. Enchantress's Presence could also be a decent target for our Fractured Identity, even though we're not going to cast a whole lot of enchantments ourselves. Now I guess with True Lane on top, that's potentially the play, since we have Coven enabled, so we can actually run it out. Triggers Kellen, and I think I decline on the Giant Killer. Putting in planes wouldn't accomplish much because of the Confounding Conundrum. But I guess it's fun to show off the synergy here. And then I can pick up the uh, Cascade if I'd like. And then I could technically still play the Giant Killer. Which, um, yeah, I guess would draw me a card with Chu Lane. So maybe that's still worth it, actually. So our sequencing sort of worked out. Now I guess there's no point. I suppose it would allow me to bluff keeping up a single blue, and our opponent does actually have the Supreme Verdict, that's painful. Alright, so back to the command zone. Probably wait on Tatiova until we can play a land afterwards, and then we can make our own luck in the meantime. Finding Mirari's Wake and Railway Brawler, both are excellent to plot. I think we go for Mirari's Wake because then next turn I can cast it for free and have access to 10 mana, at the very least. So that was a pretty fortunate hit. Our opponent doesn't have anything they can destroy. So never mind, waking the trolls can destroy my land. Actually a pretty great way to counteract Mirari's Wake. But now we might want to put our Fractured Identity to use. So let's see, how do we want to sequence? play Mirari's Wake. I could also cast Alrun's Epiphany to take an extra turn. So yeah, this is definitely happening. Could then also go Tatiova, play a land. Although Confounding Conundrum also sort of stops the uh, second chapter from doing anything on our side, since we would have to bounce a land back afterwards. 
So there's uh, quite a few options, as you can tell. Could have also opted to play Kellen before playing Mirari's Wake, which was certainly an option too. I think I'll just go Fractured Identity on the Waking the Trolls. And then we can destroy their only black source, for instance. And then I can still play Railway Brawler normally, or we could plot it. And then try and set up uh, Kellen for next turn. Could have also foretold Alrin's Epiphany. So we had options. Alright, opponent with a Golos next. Also pretty good. Now, Confounding Conundrum also stops our fetch lanes from being particularly effective. And then I'll just get back a plane since I don't want fetch lanes with Conundrum out there. Okay, so we have access to a ton of mana. Let's say I play Kellen, then play Brawler, I get a free Tatiova, then I get to play a land and take it from there. I guess it would be nice to cast uh, Alrin's Epiphany right away. But let's get some value. So I can put in Tatiova. Great Henge is also pretty cheap now. And then start with Portico. I'll have to pick up a land again, but at least we get to surveil. And then let's see. Currently have seven mana, so I can just cast Alrin's Epiphany. Or I could foretell it and then still cast a Great Henge, so we get the extra birds. But I think it's good enough to just cast here. Take our extra turn, points at 14, so they're pretty close to dead. Even though we don't get to make any troll tokens. So step one, probably Great Henge. Just cast Kellen, I don't really care about the map tokens, or do I? I guess it could help grow one of my creatures, so sure. And then it would also help trigger Kellen, but with a conundrum it doesn't matter too much. I guess it still triggers Tatiova to draw more cards. Okay, then let me explore. Play an extra land. Pick up a tapped land. Probably want to avoid the fetch land, otherwise I have to pick up multiple lands here. Guardian project. So you could play that first and then still play Vega. And then we can sack some of our map tokens. Alright, wash away is good insurance. So I can keep that up. And for now grow Tatiova. Source to plowshares is good to keep. So if I go for attacks, opponent would have to chump Tatiova and then take 10 and then we have a counter spell up, which should be good enough. All right, well, this Mirari's Wake off our uh, make your own luck proved to be pretty impactful. And there were a ton of ways we could have sequenced our spells here. A naturalist is acceptable. Want to keep this for a board wipe. Binding, I guess now that our opponent's mostly tapped out, we can just counter it. And that'll do it. Awesome, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play facing Roxanne. So they're gonna ramp into some meteorites and then into even bigger stuff. So we need a pretty explosive opening. Counter spells will also be valuable. So this hand's borderline could be a little bit better. Uh, currently only have two lands, so if we don't hit a third or fourth, we're not doing a whole lot. 
but uh, Beast is a good enabler for the Great Henge. And then we can make a 1-1 one, one on turn 1. And get maybe a blue-green dual land on turn 2. And that sets up Gross Peril. Opponent with a Signet. Okay. Getting an island was also reasonable. Drew one now. Can go for Windswept Heath and then fetch a Surveil Land to get a bit of card selection. And then Temple Garden should be fine since we still have Uro. Okay, so decisions. I could play Kellen, which then next turn, if I play the Beast, I get a free Uro. That sounds appealing. If I play a Beast now, then next turn I could play a pretty cheap Great Henge. But uh, I think Kellen first is still fine. Opponent keeps on ramping. Okay. Might also have to keep up my counterspell next turn. So step one, I imagine, is just playing the beast. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't be able to saw it coming unless I draw an untapped blue source with Uro. If I foretell the dust animus, I can keep up saw it coming for three. And then next turn we can play a cheap dust animus. Yeah, let's just uh, play it safe. Parallel lives to double their tokens. I think we let that resolve and then just plan to counter their commander instead. Don't know how many other token makers they have to leverage parallel lives. Now I regret not foretelling Sod coming, but of course I wouldn't have been able to cast it had I done that. Yeah, we once again need another untapped land, ideally. I can foretell Sod coming, and then just cast Dust Animus for pressure. This would also help discount the Great Henge, so maybe we'll start here. And then... Yeah, still can go Great Henge, keep up Sod coming. Could foretell it, but that isn't quite good enough. So instead, I think I just attack with what we have. Now I can foretell this and still cast it. If they don't make me use it, I can make a 2-2 and take it from there. Alright, so that can get countered, hopefully. And I can put an Uro. Alright, land is good, so now we can still make a Knight token end of turn. Now next turn they can still cast it for 7, and that's still going to be pretty impactful. So we want to make the most out of it while we can. Okay, so if I cast a beast, I can play a free pilgrim. And that sets up a 4 mana great hench, which is I guess still a little too expensive. So instead we'll go hench first. Then play the Beast, which gets me a free Pilgrim. And we'll get to draw a bunch of cards in the process. Okay, and then attack all out. Then I lose the 1-1. One, one. Opponent takes 7, 8, 9, down to 7 but then I no longer have a 1-1 to enable the beast. So I think we'll uh, 
play it safe. Opponent not even blocking our knight. So yeah, next turn could hurt. And there's Roxanne. Making two meteorites. And they do go for the 1-1 one, one to shut down our Lovestruck beast. Eleanor Elves will enter with a counter thanks to the Great Henge. So one of the rare circumstances where we would prefer a 1-1. One, one. But uh, yeah, opponent's still facing 7 in the air. So unless they had some removal here, they're still dead. Sweet, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Soren, Mono Black Vampires. Alright, our hand seems fine. Got a bit of ramp with Signets, some card advantage engines, and hopefully we can just outvalue the Vampire deck. But if they have an expensive one in hand to cheat and play right away, using the minus three, we could be in trouble. So for now, play Signets. And then Vizier would be the most mana efficient play here, or Elven Chorus. But with Vizier first, we can maybe turn it into a mana creature with a Chorus. Although wouldn't be surprised if this just gets instantly removed. Cast down. Oracle coming up, hopefully with a few lands on top that we get to play. That would be ideal. And opponent's able to put a Crusader in play for three lifelink. Not the end of the world. So we'll try Oracle. And a fetch land is ideal since we can fetch it away and then still maybe hit another land. Especially if I get a surveil land here. And then color wise, maybe a white one. Keep forest on top. And there we go. Full value of our Oracle. Got to ramp a bit. And then Oracle plus Fibblethip, for instance, can both plot non-land cards as well as play lands off the top, so those are quite nice together. Acolyte is coming up, so we can maybe use Skellon's ability to cast another 3-drop for free. For now, take 5, Baron pumping up their Vampires. And they can finish off Oracle here by sacking one. Alright, that's fine, we got our value. So, yeah, I think I'm into the idea of Kellen, Adventure, the Rose Thorn, and then cast it, allowing me to put in a Fibblethip for free. Could also just go a Gianni minus on Crusader. But uh, let's get Kellen out there. Reality chip coming up, so more ways to cast spells off the top. Feed the Swarm also would have been able to hit our enchantment as it turns out. Send that back to the command zone. And Preacher, that's a good one. Maybe worth taking out with a Jani. And then for now we can just take five. Provision are on top, so I could plot that for three. If I just go for a Jani, we exile Preacher, can finish off Sorin, and then Crusader finishes off a Jani. Yeah, we are at 14, so our life total is also dwindling a little bit. If I play Elven Chorus, I can uh, cast the Provisioner off the top instead of plotting it. But then we're not dealing with Preacher or Sorin, so... Yeah, we'll go for a Jani. Trade our Planeswalker with the opponents, which may not seem like a great proposition since our Planeswalker is arguably more powerful, but it does trade resources when we're ahead on resources. And then Provisioner could also make food tokens if we're worried about losing a life. Opponent actually using Thirst to take out a Jani so they can attack our face. Down to 9 we go. Now Cultivate on top. So I think I'm down to plot the Cultivate. And then maybe just cast a Provisioner. 
and then next turn I'll be able to play Kellen, play free Cultivate, putting another 3-drop in play for free, which I guess could be the Provisioner itself. And then for now we could play something like an Elven Chorus or Reality Chip. Yeah, I'll just play the Reality Chip. And then I could attack if I'm planning to just jump with O4. Opponent cycles a land end of turn. They also have a castle to draw more once they're empty handed. Ooh, opponent making me discard two and lose two. So I want to keep the provisioner. And now Blood Priest to drain me. So yeah, we're getting very low here, down to six. So definitely chumping. But we should have a decent turn lined up. There's a land on top, so that's going to get shuffled away. And then Kellen introduces an extra lifelink creature. Okay, and then on top of the deck we have a land. So I'll get to make a treasure here potentially, play land, make another treasure, and then cast make your own luck, as opposed to making food tokens, kind of like that idea. And just found a Catilda, so not the most exciting hit, uh, but I guess I'll still plot it here. And we got rid of some lands. And then Fibblethip wants to hang back. Soren might take out Kellen, but then I could still double block the Crusader. But yeah, we're running out of action here. Put on just plussing on the Blood Priest instead. In that case, how about we could double block Crusader. Gaining three in the process, keep Provisioner with the fetch land, which can gain me more life, and then we can attack down Soren next turn as well. Sure. Even though Fibblethip could be a decent source of card advantage here. Okay, so we're now drawing blind off the top. But we can play Kellen. Play Free Catilda, which puts a land in play for provisioner purposes. And now we'll start making food. And we can attack Soren. Opponent's at 55, so we've got a long way to go. But we can also start pumping the team with Catilda. So I don't hate my spot. Twilight Prophet's a good one, and we're pretty light on removal for it. And now Deadweight can answer Catilda. Can no longer pump Kellen to attack past the Prophet. The good news is our opponent does not have the City's Blessing yet for Prophet. And then I can just take three. And then sack a food token here. Get another Surveil Land. Make another food token. Don't need Command Tower. Alright, so we're hoping for an exciting top deck. Temple Garden, not quite. So do I even bother attacking with Kellen? I guess we just hold back the Twilight Prophet, but then they can pump it with Sorin. So that doesn't really help either. So I may as well gain three. And then we can trade maybe Acolyte for Blood Priest. Slightly regretting trading off Fibblethip now. Since it could have uh, kind of pulled us ahead in this spot. Put on just drawing a card with Castle. And then I'm happy to trade here.
probably no reason not to just sack all the food right now. Ooh, true lane, that's a good one. Can be a great source of card advantage, and we can pick up our own creatures to enable it. But they could have picked up another removal spell by now. Sovereign's by to drain me. And our opponent explodes, alright, so they gave up. We were finally gonna start drawing more cards on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Nissa Mono Green Ramp. So to stay in a chance, we need to have a particularly explosive start, or maybe find a counter spell for Nissa herself. This hand doesn't really meet that condition. If we had some early acceleration and then play Oracle on turn three, perhaps. As is, it feels a little slow. Although Fractured Identity is nice, I will admit. I guess we do get to curve Kellen into Kellen, and then we should find a fourth line for Oracle. Starting to talk myself into it here. All right, I'll try it. It's not the perfect start. Could have also, instead of playing the adventure, fetched a surveil lane to maybe look for some mana acceleration. Um, but now we'll just play Kellen, I think. Opponent has a glimpse on two, so they're off to a good start. Two forests on the battlefield already. I luckily found an island, so we can play Kellen. Maybe keep the fetch lane to synergize with Oracle. And then Virtue I'll put in the graveyard, since I would prefer another land. A Marwyn can also be quite dangerous when unchecked. And Blind Blade also an elf. Alright, found the land. So I get to play Oracle. See what's on top, and then still play a fetch land at the very least. A railway brawler. I think I'm okay fetching that away. And then I can grab a surveil land, make it green-white. And then don't want halfling either. Even though Dos may be combined with Chulain as a cheap creature to draw. I still need a six land for that to work. Otherwise, I could go Project plus Halfling. Nah, I'll find something better. And then I'm okay trading Kellen for Blight Blade, I think. And just draw the Pilgrim. So that worked out. And then there's a land on top. So next turn we can keep hitting those land drops. If we can keep the opponent's creature count low, then we don't need to worry about the minus 7 killing us on the spot. Although, opponent with their own 5 mana Nissa who shakes the world, essentially doubling their mana for next turn. So we might have to use Fractured Identity to answer it. Only have the one forest myself. But yeah, Nissa allowing them to empty their entire hand. Marwyn now also taps for 5 mana. So we've got a couple problems to deal with here. Can also use Nissa to untap the Portico, which makes two mana. And then... Yeah, we're pretty worried about Nissa just killing us next turn. So if I can trade off Portico for two of their creatures, that wouldn't be bad, but they can just... Double block 2-2 two, two, and 1-2. So I think just Kellen can attack. And then as we said, we can explore. And see a Silverback Elder. So that's not really going to help. Alright, let's see if we're dead. I guess they only have three forests in play at the moment. So the overrun may not kill me yet. Never mind, opponent goes for it. 
So yeah, that's survivable. They can finish off Nissa, that's fine. No blocks. Although they're not too far from just replaying Nissa a second time here. So we'd really love to find an answer to uh, Marwyn. But uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Can play True Lane, and that's my whole turn. Or Guardian Project, I guess I'll make it True Lane. Kellen can attack. Vigilant Land can attack. Probably need Oracle back on defense. If they don't draw another forest, we can maybe still take the hit. But if they just go forest, replay Nissa, I think uh, that's going to be too much damage coming our way. Alright, so it's going to be a loam speaker. Growing Marwyn. So they're maybe setting up for next turn. And land on top is excellent. So I can start with Hedge Maze. Or I can play Provisioner first. I guess I play the Provisioner. Because it's going to be hard to play Silverback Elder here since we're light on green mana. Draw the Hatch Maze with Chulain, and then I can use a Surveil to dig towards more lanes, essentially. So we'll keep the Yavimaya Coast on top. So I still haven't technically played land for the turn. Make a treasure. And then I could still play a Silverback Elder here. Which is a pretty large blocker in its own right. Draw Vanguard, hope there's more lands on top. There are. And then there's nothing to blow up with the Vanguard's ability. So we'll just hit with Kellen to gain three, I suppose. In case they don't go for Nissa, otherwise keeping it back represents an extra blocker. Alright, let's see what happens. Opponent can adapt the Incubation Druids, giving them even more mana. But it's mainly the forest count that's we're worried about. And they found a Boseju, so getting punished for not running more basics. Could still be dead regardless. They've got a lot of creatures to overrun here. I think we're actually still okay. So they might just make a token instead. Yep. An 8-8. Eight, eight. And then try and go for it next turn. Make your own luck on top of the deck. Can draw into it by just playing a creature, basically. Dust Animus will also uh, draw with Chulane. And then we get to trigger the Silverback. So we can start stringing together some things. I think I don't play the Guardian Project just yet. And then Silverback... Just wants to find more lands, which translates into additional treasure as well. Put that in play. Play a land of the top. Make a treasure. Play a land, make a treasure. And now there's an invasion, so I can fetch to shuffle. Maybe get another surveil land. See another land on top. So we can uh, maybe get rid of that. Kellen joins up, coming up next. Well, we have a lot of mana. We can play a guardian project. And then play Vanguard to draw into Kellen Joins Up. 
We can go Guardian Project into Vanguard now. And I'll spend some treasure. And then if I use the silver back, we can sort of get rid of the top card to maybe find something more exciting. Could also start gaining a life, which can help against the overrun next turn. I think I'm gonna keep trying to put lands in play. And then hope to string together some more creatures with Chulane and Guardian Project. We draw Cultivate. Behold. You can just cast Behold the Multiverse. And I need to find some cheap creatures to string together. And Jani. I wouldn't be able to cast here. Ooh, Force of Vigor, I guess also doesn't have any targets. I guess I just uh, cast Cultivate if I'd like, which will trigger a Provisioner again. And then Kellen forces a chump on Sentinel, otherwise they wouldn't be able to overrun anymore. And that's gonna be it. Alright, we did some things. But I might still be dead here. Forest number four, overrun the team. Do have some blockers. But this might still be too much damage. All right, never mind. Opponent choosing to make another token and passes it back. Well, now we get to have some more fun with Mirari's Wake. Probably tapping the Pilgrim in the process to maximize our land drops. And then we have nine in the air, so if our opponent doesn't have any interaction, they could just be dead. So I can maybe start by attacking and then maybe keep comboing second main if it didn't work out. Right, root snare, so a fog effect preventing damage. Fair enough. So now we don't have those creatures back on defense either. But glad I didn't go all out. Okay, in that case, I guess we keep going. So, I need to cast a creature pretty much to be able to draw with Guardian Project and trigger Silverback. So I can pick up Avasus Pilgrim, recast it. And then now maybe just gain life with Silverback so I can draw into our uh, Kellen. Make more treasure. Guardian Project triggers. Don't want to draw Gross Spiral so I can get rid of it here. Okay, another fetch line on top we'll take. Although we may start to run out of uh, fetchable targets. Catilda, we would love to have access to. So I can draw into it with Explore. Aloran is next, so that's more card draw. I'm 
draw the Elven Chorus so we can finally start playing Creatures of the Top. Play Tracker. Storm the Festival isn't bad. And now we get to trigger Kellen as well. Probably fine. Just uh, gaining more life here. Get a free Loron. Get a bunch more triggers. Good uh, triggers left and right. Nothing to blow up with Loron. Alrin's Epiphany would love to draw that one. And our opponent scoops it up. We get to take an extra turn to then leverage all these extra resources. And then if they don't have a second fog effect, we can attack back for lethal. Well, this was a pretty exciting game. Lots of back and forth. But uh, luckily, Nissa wasn't able to take us out on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play. Facing Marchesa, I believe is the official pronunciation. And uh, they're going to try to commit crimes, whereas we're going to be the good guys. And our hand is missing some early mana acceleration, but at least the average power level of our cards is pretty high. So, yeah, I don't mind keeping this. Because if I mulligan aggressively for a hand that has some mana elves, they may just get taken out. And they might have some hand disruption, so... Prefer keeping a hand where the average power level is pretty high. Epiphany is a nice one to hide in exile. And then I'll probably play Kellen first, because if I play Augur, we don't get any immediate value from it yet. And if we get to untap with it, it sets up Tamio pretty well. Alright, there's the Dealer of Death. And Sanctum will enter tapped. So I could just play Tamio plus on both Kellen, and then uh, if they attack Tamio, we get to draw cards as well. That seems decent, and then wait on Augur until we have a bit more mana available. And then maybe we get to Time Warp next turn as well. Acolyte could also help cast Augur of Autumn for free if we adventure it first. Although currently no permanence in our graveyard. You are setting a bad example. Catilda's not bad. Good combo with Augur of Autumn, turning our creatures into mana creatures to help cast things off the top. But uh, Kellen. We'll have to go on a small vacation here in the command zone. Could also leave it in the graveyard to set up Acolyte, but I don't think that's quite worth it. Okay, Invasion's not bad. This might be a reasonable turn for Time Warp, mostly because that allows me to take up Tamio, so we can maybe minus two without uh, losing Tamio. Although... It's not the most exciting time warp since we don't have any other value engines in play. So I could just go invasion, play a tap land, and then I guess plus time yo, so we at least draw a card on the way out. And then set up for next turn basically. Could also go Augur. Hope there's a green source on top to play Catilda, but that seems unlikely. So sure. Play the invasion. And then we're also building up our mana for Alrun's Epiphany. We don't want to play a game where we run a creature into a removal spell, our opponent gets to pay the one and find more removal. We want to try and present a ton of threats out of nowhere, basically, and try and pull ahead that way. Molten Collapse, a decent answer to Tamio, but if they attack with Marchesa here, we'll still get to draw a card, so they may not want to. Or maybe they forgot about the ability. Behold's not bad either. 
opponent passing with two mana, so they could also have a counterspell left. So how do we want to play around it? Could use Castle to make some more green mana for us. Use that to play Augur of Autumn. See if there's a land on top. And see if there's a counterspell. Brazen Borrower coming up next. So now if I were to maybe use the Acolytes, I can put Tamiyo back and draw it. And then still play Katilda. I guess we're a little short on white mana for that. I uh, could also replay Kellen, which I'm fine if it gets dealt with. And that's also a three-powered creature for coven purposes. And then I don't mind putting Tamiyo back on top here and put this in the adventure zone. But we're probably going to see some removal end of turn. We did not. Maybe they didn't want to cast a two-mana removal spell without being able to pay the one. I mean, if we do get to untap with Kellen, we've got some pretty good value to be gained. Desperado can mill us. And now go for the throat, pay the one, and get rid of Tamiyo. Fair enough. So we don't get to string together a bunch of free spells, but we still have double time warp essentially ready to go. And we'll send it back to the command zone, sure. Alright, so let's count up our mana. Can play a land of the top, giving us nine lands, maybe one more mana from castle as well. So let's say we play a land. If I go for Epiphany, I can still play Katilda. That seems like a good starting point. While well, the opponent's tapped out. Take our extra turn. Play another land of the top. So I could maybe play Kellen and then still play Time Warp and then next turn play the Acolyte to keep going. That sounds acceptable. Can hit the invasion for two and then next turn casting the uh, backside of the battle gives us another Kellen trigger. So put this in play. Oracle's always nice, can cast it thanks to Coven being enabled. Can play Oracle, putting in Dus Animus with extra counters. Force of Vigor we don't really need. So, maybe start by attacking the Invasion and the opponent. Would love to draw into a counter spell as insurance here in case of a board wipe. Kellen triggers again, put in Prismatic Vista, can also shuffle the top of our deck. Um, and yeah, I guess that's fine since Force of Vigor is not that exciting here. Maybe look for more creatures we can cast for free. Play Command Tower. Vivian's coming up, can draw into it with Acolyte. Put an island. Another land on top. Okay, so I can now behold, look for maybe a counter spell, or we can just play Vivian, which, at least if they cast a board wipe, I'll still have a planeswalker on the battlefield. That's the hope. Uh, maybe start with behold. And then I might still actually be able to cast Vivian. Inner Sun I'll keep. Makes our future spells uncounterable, so it could also be good to get out there now. Okay, and then we get to discover into Elven Chorus, which is also good if our creatures die. Might be overextending a little bit. Well, that was a pretty nice sequence of events. Let's see if they can wipe our board. If not, we should be able to take over pretty easily. And if they do, we still have some good tools available. 
Dark Ritual, oh no, here it comes, Nicol Bolas, Dragon God. Alright. So I guess I'm glad I didn't play Vivian, since I could have destroyed it. A good way to commit crimes, as it turns out. Play Magic's villain. Goes after Kellen. That's probably the least threatening creature we have, besides our birds. They do get to mill. Got rid of the railway brawler, which could have been decent. Okay, so all our spells are uncounterable. There's a force of vigor once again. So where do we want to begin? Maybe with uh, Vivian. Could use the minus two cast Kellen to search up something specific. Probably want to play the Guardian Project first. Cast Kellen. And then Reality Chip could be a good choice to help play more stuff off the top. We would get to trigger Guardian Project, draw a bunch more cards, maybe play more lands off the top with Oracle of Moldiah, play creatures off the top with Augur, Elven Chorus, you name it. And then maybe even drop a Virtue of Loyalty to pump up the team. So even if we're not necessarily winning this turn, we're just so far ahead on resources that it doesn't matter. All right, so we got to see Kellen the Kid in action. It's a pretty unique commander, kind of tricky to enable the ability, so you really want to have some engine that lets you maybe play stuff off the top of the deck, as well as some other card draw effect to fill your hands so you actually have stuff to put in play. So the way the deck ended up was just as many value engines as possible, and then use Kellen to essentially cheat on mana by putting more lands in play as the game goes on. So I've been uh, pretty happy with this build so far. Now one of the drawbacks of building the deck in this manner is that you need to have lots of creatures to get those creature synergies going, so it means less room for interaction so you don't have a ton of instant speed removal or counter spells try to sprinkle in a few of them but it does mean that you're going to be more susceptible to opposing combo decks that maybe string together some powerful synergies and you won't have too many ways to stop them but if you're just up against another creature deck trying to get the most two for ones possible then we can uh, certainly outvalue most opponents so that'll do it for today's gameplay want to thank you for watching hope you enjoyed and as always have a nice day